Hello, everyone. Welcome, Jeremy Crawford, to Dragon Talk. Hello there. How's everybody going? I just want to make sure we get audio and everything going uh, and that everything is working before we start recording our actual Sage Advice. Uh, and I do that with the very technical way of checking on the chat to make sure they're not saying sound isn't working. So, Jeremy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just here at home working away on D&D. &D. Uh, I hope everyone uh, listening and watching is healthy and our families are doing all right and that people are staying sane, maybe playing some games. I know I've been playing some remote D&D. &D. Uh, in fact, we've been we've made a point of playing uh, so far D&D &D every week. So we've actually been playing D&D &D more often uh, nice. during the quarantine. Uh, partly because we have so little else going on, so we have we have more free evenings than we normally would. Uh, so we've been uh, cheering ourselves up with uh, this game we all love. It's a great way to do it for sure. Uh, I've been uh, trying to figure out the best way to do that with my family uh, and 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 play as often as we can. But you know, even though there is this all this time in the world, there is still always this like, all right, when 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 the sun is setting, uh, I. I love my children, but there is definitely some amount of like, okay, you know what? I, I think we spent all day together. I think it's time for you to go to bed <laughs> and for us to have adult time. Uh, so, uh, so that's been combating with my, with my desire to get them into doing more regular D and D. Well, and, and uh, for your own sanity, don't tie it to sunset since uh, <laughs> the days are getting longer. I mean, I, I know you're probably getting, it's like six 30 and it's like, okay, kids bedtime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they've been staying up later, uh, uh, mostly because we've been watching a lot of like Harry Potter and, and, and other mm. fantasy movies, so which has been great. And getting them into that, you know, fandom has been wonderful. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's a thing. Maybe on the weekend. We'll, we'll see. I have the game room for it, so we'll have to play. Uh, all right. So let's uh, sounds like everything is good audio wise and uh, people are good to start. So I will introduce this segment for reels now. Hello and welcome to another segment of Sage Advice. I am Greg Tito and I'm joined by Mr. Jeremy Crawford. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you, continuing our little mini series on uh, things within the player's handbook that folks may have overlooked. Uh, maybe that was a very important part when you started with 5th edition, but you've kind of forgotten it over time. Uh, and so this has been a uh, uh, thing we did uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're going to pick it back up uh, with, I think, page 14 or 15 of the player's handbook. Is that right, Jeremy? That's right. When we left off, we were on page 14. And as I was getting ready for us to continue our journey through the player's handbook, I realized there is a rule for us to talk about on the very next page. Excellent. Uh, so this is always fascinating and let's get right to it, shall we? So everyone, if you're going to follow along with us, we're <laughs> on page 15 of the player's handbook and the rule that sometimes people don't know about that is lurking on this page. And one of the themes of this series is going to be rules either that people often forget or maybe never even saw in the first place. So this rule is in uh, the section on page 15 called Beyond First Level. Mm -hmm. Here's where we explain for you what happens when you level up. Now, many people know, of course, if you know you you just gained a new level in your class, you go to the advancement table there, and that table will explain to you what new features you get, your proficiency bonus might increase, uh, your class also tells you your hit points go up. So sometimes people will just rely on that class table, that handy reference for what happens when they level up, combined with the little section in their class that tells them also increase your hit points. And they might not actually read this section mm. that points out that if while leveling up, your constitution modifier goes up, that increase in your constitution modifier is retroactive. This is, which can result, if you don't follow this rule, result in your character having fewer hit points than they should have. And no one should it, have a character with fewer hit points than they should have. 
<laughs> I mean, unless you want to be super brittle. And I know, I know that that actually can be fun for some people, you know, the character who is like forever living on the edge, or if they have, if maybe they played first edition and they're dreaming of the wizard, you know, who will be slain by a slight breeze. Uh, <laughs> or a then, stiff drink might just put them right. over the edge. <laughs> yes, just they will, they will just waste clean away. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so uh, what this rule is getting at is, you know, first off, when you level up, you always get more hit points. You roll the hit die associated with your class and you add your constitution modifier every single time you level up. Although some people also don't realize you don't have to roll the hit die if you don't want. You could also take the average for that die and we give you that average in your class's description. But let's say you hit a level where you got the ability score improvement feature and you increased your constitution enough so that your constitution modifier went up by plus one. Mm -hmm. So what you would then do is not only add your new constitution modifier to the hit die you just rolled for your new level, but you would add that plus one to every one of your previous levels. Uh, and so that's what I mean, that it's retroactive. So if, you know, at fourth level, your constitution went up, your modifier went up by one, well, you would not only benefit from it there at fourth level, but you would actually get three extra hit points from adding that plus one to first, second, and third level. And that so. is really important because uh, it happens all the time. I mean, sometimes if you have like a 15 or a, a 13 or an odd numbered constitution modifier, uh, and at fourth level, as you said, you get those ability score increases, um, that, that bumps up all the time. And it's especially important. I mean, you can sometimes get, uh, you know, a swing of 10 to 15 hit points when gaining a level uh, because of that. And when you're the meat shield of a, of a party, that is a big difference. I mean, that's, that's talking about, you know, a, a hit or two in a round, uh, that you could survive longer. Exactly. And I even, when playing a, uh, more fragile character often like to, especially at higher levels, increase my constitution uh, so that uh, my character actually has a chance to contribute in more dangerous battles. I know sometimes people are are really drawn to creating, you know, sort of a classic glass cannon, uh, but you know, you're, you're not going to be dealing any damage if you're dead. And so, <laughs> which is a principle I, I follow not only when making my own D&D characters, but even when I'm making characters in other games, uh, you know, like when in some MMOs I've played, even when I'm playing a spellcaster, I try to make them as resilient as possible. Because again, I'm not, not going to be healing anyone or dealing any damage if I'm bleeding out on the floor unconscious. I feel like you're full of uh, uh, bumper sticker statements already and during this segment. <laughs> People should live by. You're not yes. going to deal any damage if you're dead. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, the, the bottom line is even if you're a, a glass cannon type, you consider increasing that in that constitution, especially at high level be, and then because of this retroactive rule, you'll get this windfall of extra hit points. Uh, since like, if you do this, you know, post 10th level, just think like, you know, your hit points, points will just suddenly jump uh, at that point. Yeah, that's important. Now, is that also uh, true for um, multi-classing? Does that affect that at all? So uh, yes, yeah, because it, it is retroactive for all of your levels, essentially for your levels as a character. Got it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, you get to benefit uh, from this rule, whether you are uh, a multi-class character or a single class character. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Good to know. And I have pulled that out in a session or two while leveling up and surprised uh, the, the group with that knowledge. So it is, it is true. It is not always what widely known. All right, you ready for our journey to continue? Yes. All right, I am going to uh, skip most of chapters two and three. Chapter two is all about the game's uh, main playable race options. Chapter three is about the game's classes. 
I'm skipping over these because they have mostly rules that are specific to those races and classes. And we're gonna focus here on uh, rules that apply to pretty much everybody. That said, I do wanna pause for a moment on page 17. This is the first page of the races chapter where we give you a brief overview of the types of racial traits that each race gets in the game. And one of those traits is sort of teetering on the line between story and rules, and that's the alignment trait. Mm. And I wanted to, to pause here because sometimes I will get asked, you know, must uh, my dwarf or my elf conform to the race, I mean, I'm sorry, the alignment note in the racial trait. And I wanted to bring people's attention to the fact that here in this overview for alignment, we make it very clear, it is your choice as the player, what the alignment is of your character. The, the alignment suggestions that are given in each race are just that, suggestions. They're you know, your hands are not tied uh, as a player. And also what you should take from this is not every member of one of these species is the same. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in the sort of fantasy tales, there are certain uh, tendencies that have been typical in Dungeons and Dragons. But at the end of the day, you as the player choose. And also that means more broadly speaking, the dungeon master also chooses when it comes to those broader cultures. So I just wanted to, to point that out that we say right up front, you choose and you can you know, go with the suggestion or you can just turn your back on it and say, no thanks, I'm gonna do my own thing. Yeah, and there's, there's so much precedence in um, fantasy characters bucking those tropes. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a very important thing. But in order to have those trope bucking tropes, you almost need to have this baseline. And that's what these suggestions are meant to 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 point out that like, OK, yes, in general, dwarves are this way or elves are this way or half orcs are this way. But that gives the option for them to have, um, you know, your more individual character story come to life. Exactly. And then even when you've made your choice, your choice has very little game mechanical weight for your character. It's really crucial for people to remember that your character's alignment is describing that character. It is not prescribing how they are supposed to behave. Right. I say this because sometimes, uh, whether in person or in a streamed game, you might hear somebody say, your character can't do that because your alignment is X or a lawful good character would never do that. The thing is, each character can do whatever they want. Their alignment is simply describing the general drift of them as a person when it comes to their moral and ethical compass. It is not a set of restraints. Uh, a person who's normally lawful good might act chaotic someday. You know, they're not a robot. They're not a, they are not a manifestation of a particular alignment the way some of our otherworldly creatures in D&D are. Like if we've, in contrast, we're talking about certain angels, for instance, in the game, many of them are literally goodness and lawfulness embodied. Uh, similarly, you know, devils are lawfulness and evilness incarnate. The mortals who we play in D&D are not alignments incarnated. They are people who are completely free to make their own choices. And the alignment is really uh, no more heavy for your character in terms of uh, rules weight than say your personality traits that you choose in your background. Alignment is just one more way to describe at a high level who is your character. Mm. Uh, but in, and even more precisely, who was your character the day you made that character? Uh, because over time, uh, in asking yourself, who is my fighter today? Or, you know, how is my bard evolved? You might discover that 
your personality tra traits have changed, and over time, your character's alignment might even change. Yeah. That suddenly, as you describe your behavior, you'll think, hmm, one of these other alignments is actually a more accurate label now for who my character has become. Just as well as you would go, you know, think about your 13-year-old self and how... <laughs> Yeah, your yes. ideals and your alignment may have been very different from your 40 year old self. Um, you know, there, there could be similarities. They could be the exact same, but in most uh, ways you have changed and evolved and your D and D characters are no different. Now they might have a, you know, a, a constrained timeline uh, of, of a campaign, but you know, it is, it is, it is important to think that alignment is mutable. Yes, absolutely. And descriptive rather yeah. than prescriptive. Right. Yeah, because there, I mean, in previous editions, there used to be lots of things to be like, oh, a a, uh, a paladin must be of this kind or a monk. If you change your alignment, then you lose your monk powers. And there's nothing like that in fifth edition, correct? Right, right. And even some of our spells that are uh, on the on the tin, when you sort of like you read the name, uh, like dispel evil and good, many of those spells, we carried forward their traditional names, but they typically refer not to alignment, but to creature types, mm. uh, and, and specifically to those types of creatures that are alignments incarnate, celestials, you know, fiends, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, as opposed to people. Uh, whereas, yeah, earlier editions of the game, your alignment could actually be very weighty for you in the game mechanics. Uh, there were even the alignment languages. You know, people who haven't played uh, first edition don't realize that one of the languages you would write on your character was "I speak lawful good," and it it, it was <laughs> it was often described back then as you know not necessarily like a language, but you know sort of a set of of like jargon and and whatnot that you could use to identify somebody who had a similar outlook on life. Uh, but again, I thought even back then as a kid, when I would w write that on my character sheet, I was just like, what the heck does this mean? Yeah. A lawful good language. What would that sound like? I don't even know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Pla maybe classical music. You know, and <laughs> Angels singing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You, you converse yeah. in hymn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. That, that... That would get old really fast. Yes. <laughs> that entire D and D session devolve into uh, go tell it on the mountain or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I like it. I would like it the first few times, but then I'd be like, "Whoo, we need to change this up." For sure, it's like it's like that person who picked their character voice to be. Uh, it's going to sound like Kermit, and then you can do that the entire session. And you're like, "Oh gosh, you're going to hurt yourself." Mm -hmm. but you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's uh, what's another? Uh, aspect uh from or rule from the player's handbook that folks may have skipped over all right so we are going to jump over the class chapter even though it is a game rule extravaganza uh, but it is again a set of exceptional rules that apply to not only the individual classes but the individual subclasses and we've covered those on on various sage advices too like wild shape and things like that so this is Absolutely. much more about going into the uh, to the general. So uh, we're going to head into chapter four, which is all about uh, establishing your character's personality and background, which connects to what we were just talking about, alignment. Now, one thing that's here that some people sometimes miss, it's not a rule so much as a tool, and that is if you want to roll up your character's height and weight, We've given you an, a way to do that based on the species you chose for your character. So if you're ever stumped making your character and you're like, how much would a dragonborn weigh? We've got a table for you. And, and, that, and your height and weight uh, can inform each other in this little table that we created. This table is also thankfully free of the error we have in Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, where we have a similar table. I don't know if you know about this, where because of, uh, in, in this little uh, this little equation for figuring out your character's weight, we put the parentheses in the wrong place. And so oh. like a, a centaur character, it could be, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of pounds. 
<laughs> it, it's actually it is already going to be corrected in future printings. Oh, good. But I was I was actually hesitant to fix it, partly because it was so funny. <laughs> Well, we, I mean, we played a couple of, of sessions with a centaur as a character uh, that was in a dungeon and trying to go up ladders and whatnot. And, and so we have, uh, we have devised that, uh, that, you know, there's, there's thousands of pounds. I mean, a horse is a huge, a huge creature when you really think about it. That actually tracks right like I, but not as heavy as that table sets up because oh. the table is the table is like you know d go up to the tallest building in water deep and drop this centaur off and see how deep <laughs> into under mountain it drills <laughs> given its weight oh, man. <laughs> oh boy so the right here in the same chapter uh, after a further discussion of alignment, languages, etc., there is a bit I'd like to pause on about backgrounds. Now, backgrounds are a fabulous way for people to establish who was my character before I became an adventurer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that is a great way to really zero in on, you know, what were the circumstances of my life as I was growing up? Uh, who, who might have been important to me? Because like, if you pick soldier, well, immediately you can imagine well, probably members of uh, a troop I was a part of, maybe my commanding officer I'm very close to, or maybe they are uh, an adversary of mine. Uh, backgrounds are a really rich way to flesh out who your character is. But in the process of getting to the backgrounds in the book, you know, deciding, do I want my character to have been an acolyte or a sage or a folk hero? It's really easy to miss that right before the individual backgrounds, there is a section that introduces backgrounds and introduces several very crucial rules related to how you're building your character. So the first one is, and I'll be curious, by the way, if you know all of these. So let me know, uh, actually, not only for these, but for anything else in this series, I'm, I'm just sort of almost like a, I have this academic curiosity. If I manage to come up with one where you're like, I, I didn't even know that. Um, so one of them, and I know some, some people watching and listening uh, are aware of this rule, but mm -hmm. I think some people aren't. And that is when you're making your character, if you have... Two different things, say your racial traits, for example, and your background, that give you the same proficiency. For instance, maybe they both give you proficiency in perception. You get to pick a different proficiency to, to take so that essentially you don't miss out on a skill proficiency. Oh, uh, so, I did not know that. Um, hey, look, we yeah. found one. I, I yeah. would I would always have assumed that they just you just pick one or did that that um they just overlap each other so you don't get another choice but you just you can put anything in there are there any caveats to that at all none other than that it has to be the same type of proficiency meaning if it was a tool if you have sort of duplicate tool proficiencies the tool proficiency you then pick has to I mean the proficiency you pick has to be a tool proficiency oh I see. Similarly, if you have duplicate skill proficiencies, uh, when you pick a replacement for one of them, it has to be a skill proficiency rather than a tool proficiency. But beyond that, it can be anything you want. So if, if your race and your background both give you proficiency in perception, you still get proficiency in perception, and then you get a second skill proficiency, which can be any skill of your choice. Mm. And so again, I think I think uh, there are probably many people like you who don't realize they might actually be owed a proficiency or two yeah. uh, because of this rule. Now, the, the key is this rule only applies at first level when you're oh. picking your background. So later on, if you end up with duplicate proficiencies, it works the way you thought it works, which is essentially they, they just sort of combine together, um, or rather, you know, basically one, one of them gets canceled out uh, because uh, you, you can get proficiency in something only once. Right. Well, how does that interact with backgrounds uh, and uh, class proficiency lists where it's like choose two out of these five? 
how, how does that interact uh, with what so, the rule that you just said? Uh, so in that case, you, you would essentially uh, end up with the same number of, of skills. Because for instance, uh, let's say you have a background that just gives you proficiency and perception. And then maybe you're trying to game it and you see, oh, my, my class lets me pick two proficiencies, gives me five options, and one of those is perception. I'm going to pick perception because of this other rule uh, that will let me now get another proficiency in its place. Well, you were going to get another proficiency in its place anyway. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess the, the difference there is that you get to choose from any of them. Right. So if you're if you're saying yes. I'm going to choose perception, uh -huh. but then I can choose from any skill, then that is yeah. a benefit to a to a character. in that. Yes, case. you you could actually ga game it that way, because uh, as the way we worded it is if a character would gain the same proficiency from two different sources, they can choose a different proficiency of the same kind skill or tool instead. Hmm. Now, we're OK with you gaming that that way. And again, to make sure to everyone listening, you're not actually gaining an extra proficiency in this case. Uh, you very astutely, Greg, are seeing what you're gaining is more flexibility. It's allowing you basically to break out of your class's uh, skill list. We're okay with that because of another rule that is on the same page about backgrounds. And that is on this page where we have a section called customizing a background, we explain to you that you can actually build your background however you want. Mm. Every background in the game is really just an implementation of this customizing a background rule on page 125 of the player's handbook. Part of that rule is we reveal to you when you're building your own background, you can choose any two skill proficiencies you want. Right. And, and the reason why we're okay with that is which skill proficiencies you have access to as a character, particularly a character creation, is much more a story thing than it is a game balance thing. Right. Uh, and we really, we, we sort of, you know, if this, if this were a card game, we tip our hand on this in this rule where we basically tell you, if you want to build your own background, pick any two skill proficiencies you want. Now, we, we are hoping that the two you pick will have some kind of cool connection to your character's story, but that's really all we're aiming at here. The reason why the fighter has the list of skills available to them in their class is not because we're balancing the game around your skill proficiency list. It's no, we pick the ones that help define what fighters are like. Yeah. Similarly, you know, when you get to the wizard, the proficiencies there are the ones that we expect a wizard would have access to because of their bookish lifestyle. You know, that's why they don't have athletics because they spend all their days in the library. I identify with this statement. But I, I mean, <laughs> but then you could also come up with a. I mean, I've done. I think I've made this character that was a fighter mage that had, uh, um, you know, some training as a soldier and was basically like a battle mage, right? And so I yeah. wanted to have the skills available to the. No, I think I chose a fighter first because I wanted uh, uh, the bump in in hit points in that first level, mm -hmm. and then yeah. uh, was all the rest of the classes after that were wizard for that reason was because I had those those access uh, early on. But it sounds like what you're saying is is as long as there's a story reason or or you know you work with your DM to come up with something that makes sense to the both of you, as long as that is is, is there, then the rule is satisfied. I, absolutely, because the much more important thing for us rules wise is the number of proficiencies you have, yeah. not actually what they are. Uh, because it is actually the number of proficiencies you have that is a, a strong differentiator. Rogues, for instance, have a lot part, of what, yeah, part of what makes them special is they are able to apply their proficiency bonus to more roles, to more different types of roles than members of most other classes. That's what's you know, when, when we're really boiling down to the game mechanics, that's what's crucial to us when it comes to class identity. Mm -hmm. What's sort of attached to those proficiencies 
it's that's really about story. That's really about who is your character. Yeah. And again, we have codified that right here in the customizing a background rule. And so people shouldn't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something naughty. Uh, if I'm doing this, <laughs> I'm Jeremy's going to be mad game. at me. <laughs> yeah, He's no. going to wag his finger at me. <laughs> I, I will wag my finger only if you're really being naughty. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> which is which is almost never about rules. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Good point, right? <Rick. laughs> uh, I I love that too. I didn't realize also that the player's handbook had rules for creating your own backgrounds, uh, yeah. which is which is a really handy thing that I think more people should should. I mean, there's a lot of wealth of of, of published backgrounds out there, but I think I'd love to see a lot more folks jump into that kind of design space for their individual characters. Absolutely. Uh, to uh, really ponder what were the particulars of my character's past and then craft a background that matches it. Because our original vision for backgrounds was exactly that, that we actually thought many players would want to make their own. And then we provided a bunch that were essentially examples of what you could do rather than the other way around of thinking of, I must pick one of these pre-built ones. And if my DM lets me, I maybe will customize one. And it was, I mean, because we actually present to you how to make your own before we even show you the example backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, and that's something, this is, you know, in our last episode, I talked about, you know, sometimes I think about, well, if I were doing it differently today, one of the things I would do here is, really accentuate more you get to choose this this is your character's story and still have all these great background options but really highlight the fact these are examples if they work for you cool run with it because they're here for your convenience but if you're really excited to make your own awesome do it uh you know th this is your story I like that. I mean, I've definitely enjoyed the fact that multiple books that we've put out have provided more backgrounds that are uh, mm -hmm. as examples than what is in the player's handbook. But there's also been a few moments where I've been like, man, none of these really fit my conception of this character right now. Um, and I think armed now with this knowledge, I, I would I feel a lot more liberated and excited to jump into designing my own background uh, with my Dungeon Master. So uh, cool. Makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Fabulous. Well, I think we uh, have talked a lot, uh, as we are wont to do, uh, you and I, Jeremy. Uh, I think we're at a, f a half hour here. So uh, did you, was there a, one more thing you wanted to get in before we jump perhaps to another? No, because we the next one has us jumping into the equipment rules. Ah. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through Chapter uh, 5 of the Player's Handbook in one episode. So we should probably save that for next time. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. As always, how can people get in touch with you uh, about more specific rules questions or, you know, just to, just to chat about what background they are? Uh, I, you can reach me at Jeremy E. Crawford. And please do tell me what your background is and make some backgrounds, people. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, I think folks have definitely uh, published things on the Dungeon Masters Guild, a lot of backgrounds uh, for uh, the, the campaigns and storylines that we've been producing out there. But yeah, it's definitely a, a fertile design space that more people can get into. So I can't wait. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and for all, all the sage advice that you've given us over the over the years, Jeremy. Um, I think that's it. We're going to get out of here. I am at Greg Tito. I don't have any backgrounds to, to share, uh, but maybe I'll be <laughs> designing some in my spare time uh, over the next few weeks because uh, I, I am inspired. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks. Uh, that has been our recording of Dragon Talk for today. Uh, you are all wonderful people. I'm going to just chat, look in the chat real quick uh, just to see, make sure everyone is enjoying it. Uh, Riot Girl Kali says they always do a custom background. So they, Excellent. They, they knew it already. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, you are wonderful. Uh, and we will be returning next week. Uh, there is some fun stuff happening over the weekend here on D and D. Uh, I'm sorry, twitch.tv slash D and D. Uh, so check out, uh, tales from the mist tonight at 6 PM. Uh, I think, uh, Bidman plays is, is starting up in about 10 minutes. So you'll be able to jump into that as well. And, uh, there is, uh, 
uh, a lot more happening this weekend, and I can't pull up the schedule right now, so I won't be able to throw it at you. Um, wait, maybe I can do it. Because um, I definitely wanted to make sure that... Yes, Rivals of Waterdeep, I believe, will be picking back up again on uh, this Sunday, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, there is some more happening as well with uh, D4 at 4 p.m. Pacific Time on Sunday. All right, everyone. Uh, take care of yourself and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Hopefully it ends quickly and I can switch from coffee time to uh, cocktail time very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks again, Jeremy. You're the best. And uh, uh, thank you. We are going to be out of here.